Okay. So what I want to talk to you guys about today, and all you guys are, are, are you know, you're doing analytics, you're making data-driven decisions. And so what I want to talk about is not necessarily like statistical techniques or anything like that, but I want to give you lessons for the data-driven, things that you want to think about, things that you can convey when you talk to other people, when you try to convince them of ideas. And I'm going to tell you all these through really through the lens of what we did at the Blackjack Tables. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is probably the most important moment in my life, the moment that I really became data-driven. I was 21 years old. I had just learned this system, the MIT Blackjack team, where you use uh, data to beat the house, you use math to beat the house. And every decision you make at that Blackjack table is 100% objective, right? There's no subjectivity. The numbers are all played out. You know, Blackjack was big data before there was even such a thing because you have so much data about how to play the hands and you can simulate it out. You can run a Monte Carlo simulation and you can know what to do at every hand of the Blackjack table. So I sit down and the math calls for me to bet two hands of 10,000. So I do and on the first one I get a pair of nines, on the second one I get 11 on the, and the dealer has a five up. So everything I do here is governed by something called basic strategy, which is basically just the exact right thing to do. Pair of nines against the five, what do I do? I split, which means I get put another $10,000 down, I get to play each nine separately. On the first nine, I get a two to make 11, I double that down, put another $10,000 down, and I get an eight to make 19. On the nine, I hit it to make 19, and on the 11 against the five, what do I do? I double down. I double that again. I get an eight to make 19. I have 19, 19, 19 against the dealer's five. How much money do I have on the table? 50,000. Like, this is always like, it's always amazing to me how hard this is for people to get. I was at the national, speaking at the National Accountants Association. And I'm like, okay, you guys should be able to get this. But they couldn't. They got it all wrong. And I was like, no wonder my taxes are always screwed up. So, <laughs> 19, 19, 19 against the dealer's five. I'm data driven. I got good hands. Dealer flips the six to make 11 and then gets a king to make 21. I lose $50,000. This woman behind me shrieks, oh my God, that's my entire mortgage. I want to turn around and go, where the hell do you live? Because I live in San Francisco. That's a cardboard box on the tenderloin. I just lost $50,000. And now the math actually called for me to bet three hands of $10,000. What's fascinating about Blackjack is it's sort of this ultimate Petri dish to understand how to make better data-driven decisions. And the first one is this idea of favoring data over gut. So the average Blackjack player loses about 3% of the money they put on the table. If you just play basic strategy perfectly, so basic strategy is this matrix that you see on the board, and on the left side, there's the player's hand, so that's what you have. On the top, there's what the dealer is showing. Based on that, you can you know, uh, go through this matrix and you can understand what you should do at any hand at the blackjack table. Okay, and this is a, done through computer simulation. They know this is correct. And if you do this perfectly, it reduces the casino's edge down to half a percent. You're almost playing an even game. But what is so fascinating is that people that know basic strategy don't actually do it. And why is that? Why do they not do it? Well, there's a lot of biases, I think, that we all have in our lives. And if you think about being data-driven, one of the best reasons to be data-driven is because humans are bad at making decisions. We make emotional decisions. And if you are data-driven, you can avoid making those mistakes. Some other great lessons in the idea of favoring data over gut is the fallacy of the gut feeling. So who I like to call the most dangerous human being in the world is Malcolm Gladwell. Okay, Malcolm Gladwell is an unbelievable writer, and he can take these unbelievable concepts and make us all believe them. But oftentimes, they're just not totally correct. The idea of the gut feeling of being able to blink and make a better decision than actually using data to make a decision. Right? I always say to people, if you're making a decision, do you want more information or less information? You guys have seen those like sell your phone commercials where they have the kids sitting around and they're like, do you want more or less? Well, it's, it is that simple. You know, if I have a chance to have more information, I want more information to make a decision. And that's the whole idea of data-driven decision making. And then finally, looking at the decision and the outcome and separating the two of them 
is so important to understanding how to be data-driven, especially understanding how to convince people to be data-driven. Right? It's very easy if we go to a casino tonight for us to sit there, and I'll stand behind you, and, and, and we're actually working on bringing me out next year to, um, to the Global Summit out in Vegas, where I can probably just stand behind you at the tables and tell you what to do, probably within, not within 20 feet, but close. But I'm standing behind you, let's say next year in Vegas, the dealer has a, a 16, sorry, you have a 16 and the dealer has a nine up, and then you tell, say to me, hey, Jeff, what did you say I was supposed to do here? And I say, hey, you're supposed to hit. If you get a five to make 21 and win, I'm a genius. But if you get a six to make 22 and lose, I'm a moron that they never should have made a book or a movie about. But in both cases, that decision was 100% correct. One was just a poor outcome, and one was a great outcome. So there's this idea of being outcome biased. And you know, what we always say is, hey, focus on the process, not the results. If you have great process, you'll always eventually have great results. So I think focusing on the big picture and being data-driven go hand in hand. So one of the nice things about being data-driven is that, like I said before, you can avoid uh, making bad emotional decisions. And so there I am, Jeffrey the dealer, in case you guys didn't believe me. I always have this up there as sort of an example of one of my you know, most stressful decisions I've ever made. So those of you guys that play blackjack, have you ever split tens? Raise your hand if you split tens. Wow. So if you're not counting cards, I'll assume you guys are all card counters. Because if you're not counting cards, there is no reason to split tens. Never should you split tens. But we talked about card counting being the knowledge of how many tens, face cards, and aces remain in a deck versus how many low cards. So if you have a pair of tens and the dealer has a six up, and you know almost every card that you haven't seen is a ten, a face card, or an ace, what do you think you should do there? You should probably split those tens, right? Expected value is higher. So this is sort of this advanced strategy that you learn as you get further into blackjack. And I had just learned this, and everyone preaches to you, hey, this is a really valuable thing to do. The expected value is so high, much higher, that you really need to do it if you get this, this case. And so I was um, walked into a casino at MGM Grand. I put down two hands of $9,000. On the first one, I got a blackjack. On the second one, I got a pair of tens. And the dealer had a six up. So I'm scanning the table, and I realize, oh, my God. This is a hand I should split. So the dealer looks at me. No one's going to split tens with nine with nine thousand dollars on the table. She starts to go buy my twenty. And I look at her. I said, uh, "Excuse me, ma'am. I think I want to split those." And she said, "You want to what those?" I think I, I want to. And then as she's looking at me, I'm like, uh, "Gosh, maybe I don't want to split those." And I'm wondering, like, why am I so scared to split those? And I realize as I look around the table at the people at the table, at the crowd of people that are now gathered around to see this snotty-nosed kid split tens, and the floor people, and the dealer, I realize at that moment that I'm scared. I don't want to cause conflict. And I'm falling for something called groupthink, where I'm letting others at the table influence my decision. I'm making a decision to avoid conflict. But they don't have the technology, the data, the innovation that I have. If they knew what I knew, if they had the information that I have, would their opinion be different? Would they split those tens? Maybe. But they probably would understand the decision a lot more. And we fall for this all the time. And it's something we can't fall for because think about the ways and the things that we know now that we didn't know five years ago. And in five years, think about what we're going to know that we don't know now. And think about the access to data and how much more data is being created and how decisions are going to be different as we get more information and as we get better technology. And if I go into a meeting with someone that's been at this company for 30 years, and they say, hey, we've been doing it this way, and I say, oh, God, I don't want to upset this person, I am not going to be able to innovate. 
as someone that is data-driven, as someone that is looking for new ways, ways to improve the way companies do things, I cannot be afraid of conflict. 